Okay, here we go. Here we go. Part two. I got all fired up. All right, now listen to what Roland Baker says. This is one of the neatest guys in all of Christianity, and he makes a comment. He makes a comment that is so big and so amazing. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. This is one of the greatest stories, like literally alive on this earth. Here we go. And I'll especially compare with scripture. So they had this in, well, let me just say, this was the greatest outpouring of revelation I have ever heard of anywhere in the world, anywhere in the church, in 2,000 years of church history. I've been a student of church history, biblical studies, systematic theology, as long as I can remember, 10 years of, great, of college study. There has never in recorded church history such a, an intense, continuous group, corporate outpouring of revelation like this, ever, ever, in any revival, in any history book, in the life of any saint, anywhere, ever. But it was reserved for the most remote, the least of these, the most unlikely spot, not in some great institution of learning, not in some great church gathering, not in the assembly of a huge number of very highly qualified, famous, well-known preachers and teachers and theologians, not in some Western society where there's a huge amount of communication to make the most of it. It was in the most remote place with the most forgotten, the most... <laughs> you just could not find any place, any group of people more unlikely to receive so much. It's like God just turned everything upside down in our scale of values. He didn't go to the, the most educated, the most capable, the most talented, the ones with the biggest audiences, the ones that commanded the most attention, the ones that likely would have the most influence the leaders, the shakers, the pastors, the... He went all around the world to a remote, remote, remote valley in West China to little beggar children that weren't even interested. It's not like they were even seeking God and poured all this out. Okay, so, I want to draw your attention to the scripture that says, God's character is to hide stuff. Because evil has come into this world, God hides the goodies to try to find out who's really seeking. It is God's propensity to hide things. And it is the propensity of noble souls, kingly souls, to discover things and then bring them out to the human family. This is what I'm doing. When I saw what Darren Wilson was doing, what he was doing eclipsed anything that I was doing just on the streets asking people, has anything supernatural ever happened to you? When I heard this, I my mind was blown. And now, from my compassionate tour of the church mess in America, 63 years of life, having been, having become a global citizen when I was 16 years old, toured Europe on trains, went to Russia, Soviet, Communist Russia. Lived in San Francisco and drove back and forth across the country. San Francisco, New York, New Orleans, Philadelphia, all over the place. London, and little towns in the middle of nowhere. Iowa and Kansas. My whole world traveling 
love of the human family, global citizen life, and then 24 years of compassionately touring the church mess in America that I hated and slandered because I knew that there was missing stuff and wrong stuff and things that were just not right going on. And I've even got comments to make to Heidi and Roland that I haven't he heard them yet make. This thing is awesome. And I give this to you. I bless you, Darren. I bless you, Eric Ray. I bless you, Mission Teens people. I bless you, Meltari. And all the people that have contributed and cared. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now is the time where we build. Now is the time where we become family. When everything is clearly falling apart and the juggernaut is showing its hand in taking control of the world, we now get to be the sweet little family, clusters of two or three families, full of heavenly stuff. And literally all my grandfather could do was watch, take notes, take down stories. And so he wrote this book on this revival titled Visions Beyond the Veil. And the reason it's so encouraging to the modern Christian is that it's not a pastor's opinion, it's not a theologian's opinion, it's not his sermons, it's not his devotionals, it's not his ideas, it's not what he thinks we should do as Christians, it's not his effort at making God look good. It's not his effort at making people interested in God. It's his recording what God decided to do on his own to glorify himself. And all we are doing is being in awe at how God himself chooses to make himself known in this world and how he chooses to touch people and where he chooses to do it and how he chooses to do it. And we, we just, we are just in complete awe that that he's chosen us to be a part of it. So I learned from that that God likes to start at the bottom, not at the top. And so when Heidi and I really, really wanted to see more revival, really, really got hungry to see more than we had ever seen, really, really were bored with church and just did not want to keep going as we were, we thought about starting at the bottom, deliberately choosing the deepest bottom we could find in the whole entire world to see a sequel to Visions Beyond the Veil. And so where would that be? And again, God takes the initiative. We don't take the initiative. God always takes the initiative, and we get the benefit of that. He takes the initiative. He put Mozambique on our path. Let us know about it. Um, steered me toward all the research where I found out lots more about Africa. So coming to Africa actually was God's initiative in us, starting with my grandfather's ministry in China, and then of course sovereignly picking out Heidi. That's another whole huge story and then bringing our families together and intertwining them together and bringing us to Mozambique. And so this was, coming to Mozambique was a deliberate effort to find the least likely place for revival we could possibly find in the world. And to, and to find people that, that had the least chance that we could find of ever having anything good happen to them. <laughs> That's the deal, see. Find the absolute worst that the devil can do. Find the people, even the church people aren't interested in. When we first came to Maputo, even what existing pastors there were, thought we were totally wasting our time. Exactly what they told my grandfather. You are wasting your time. These street kids will never be any good. Why don't you come to our church and talk to our kids? Because then you'll get somewhere. So <laughs> that's that's how we started in a you know really abbreviating a lot of stuff and skipping the really 
lot of the miracle stories just to get the overview. What happened when we got here was within a few months, our children began to have visions. Our children began to go up into heaven and sit on the backs of angels, dance around the throne of God. Our children began to sit with angels who loved to sing our own Changan songs, you know, in our dialect down here in Mozambique. Our children were being taken to the throne of Jesus to talk to him. Jesus began to talk to our kids and say, I want you to go back and, and I want you to tell everybody you know they're not ready yet and I'm coming soon and, and they need to get ready. And our kids began to be our preachers. And these first kids that we started with off the streets became our best preachers. We started with an old, abandoned, dilapidated, ransacked, vandalized shell wreck of a orphanage in Maputo. The government didn't have a dime to take care of, neither did anyone else. No aid agency, nobody had any interest in taking care of this place. We didn't have any money either. <laughs> so he said, we'll take care of it. You just let us on the land and we'll take care of the kids, fix everything, just leave it to us, we said to the government. So we did. In those early days, the Holy Spirit came on our kids. I, that was, that's still our, some of our best memories. These kids were in rags. We didn't have money to even buy them new clothes. They were in black, filthy rags. They slept on the cold cement floor. It was very cold the winter there. Not even a grass mat. We had no paint for the walls. The place hadn't been touched, fixed, repaired in 20, 30 years. How many kids We started with 80 kids. Came with the government orphanage. Toilets were stopped up. Doors were chopped down for firewood. Copper ripped out of the walls, wiring for The roofs were <clears throat> full of holes, everything's leaking. Wires were sagging down, sparking in the water, everything shorting out. Kids were just living on the floor like animals, feces everywhere. Demon possessed, swollen up. Demons were throwing things in the night, choking them. Gangs were busting through the place. Machine guns firing bullet holes off the the walls in the night, stealing kids. We moved out there in the early days ourselves, woke up every morning to machine gun fire, witch doctors chanting through the night, trying to curse us. It was so much fun. <laughs> kids were just terrorized, but it's okay. We cleared out all the demons. We miraculously started getting support. Kids would stay up all night long praying for their daily food. Food would just show up in trucks. Support would come in we never asked for. People we don't know. Uh, kids would be caught up in visions. They would, be, I, they, they would be in worship on their knees and their rags on the bare cement floor. Bare bulbs hanging down from the ceiling sobbing with tears running down their faces, so thankful, just sobbing in Portuguese, Abdegada Jesus, you know, just thank you, Jesus, for saving me. That's all they were thanking him for. They weren't thanking him for miracles. They weren't thanking him for visitations. They weren't thanking him for trips to heaven. They weren't thanking him for awesome financial breakthroughs. They weren't thanking him for anything but for saving them just saving them just saving them <sighs> and these kids barely had heard any teaching barely had heard any any the holy spirit was just on them like my grandfather's kids, they had this huge supernatural appreciation of salvation. Just huge appreciation for, to, for being saved from eternity without hope and without God. You didn't have to embellish it. You didn't have to entice them with immediate miracles. You didn't have to entice them with a nice place to stay and more clothes and more blessings and more, more things to do and better jobs and 
a nicer family and you didn't have to entice them with anything like that. You didn't have to entice them with promises of ministry and blessings and taking back from the devil what he stole from us or anything like that. They are just thrilled to the absolute core of their being with being saved. Just being saved. They know what they're saved from, which very few people know. Now, and then, <laughs> everything else comes after that. <laughs> uh, I was curious as you were talking, how did you get your hearts, how did you get your hearts growing up at that place where you wanted to go to the forest of the poor? Like, was it, are you guys just at normal or? Uh, do you guys no, we're just really weird, but come to think of it, we're, we're trying to get normal. <laughs> we think people that don't want to help those who are hurting more than they are, are the abnormal ones. <laughs> That's our abnormality. When you're blessed and someone else is not as blessed as you are, it's just abnormal not to care. It's just the most abnormal thing in the world when you are blessed and you see someone right next to you that's not as blessed to, to want to even that out. That's just normal. But you were uh, in China and you were helping. Yeah, we were already. What, what made you want to go even deeper into? Yeah, because we know there's, there's people that, we knew that there's all kinds of people in the world in remote places that didn't have the benefits of Hong Kong. Uh, it's, it's no credit to us you know it, it, God takes the initiative he puts these things in your heart um, <laughs> it's the good shepherd Jesus said the good shepherd leaves the 99 in the fold because they're safe and okay. And he goes out and finds the one left who's not. And that's, that's just Jesus. That's just the nature of God. What, what happened in China was that I saw the nature of Jesus work out. If you hardly ever see much of that in the church, that's, you don't get that touched. But what I saw in China was the heart of the Good Shepherd. I saw the Savior Himself come down out of heaven, let the satisfied churches and the content churches, let the churches who already have everything they want, and go into a remote, remote corner of China and just reveal himself in this most stunning, incredible, awesome way, just as he chose to the least of these. That's the good shepherd leaving 99 in the fold, all nice and safe, and going out and finding that, that lost sheep on the hill, hillside out in the dark and in the rain, and not just finding him, and not just bringing him back like all the others, but making it up to him absolutely making it up to him what all he's been through you know the years of abandonment and suffering and trauma and, and just just staggering hopelessness making it up to him with these incredible revelations so much so that these abandoned traumatized children became pillars of the church in that province they became the fiery pillars of the church when they grew up. Um, right away, they became super energized preachers. You spend three months in heaven, and soon your perspective changes. <laughs> it's real tough to love this world anymore after three months in heaven. It's tough. It's not easy. It's real tough to keep your mind down here anymore. You don't have to jack your mind up there and get yourself spiritually minded on Sunday once in a while. 
it's real tough to stay down here at all. It's real tough to be here at all anymore. You have to make yourself want to stay down here. It's not easy. You understand? You don't want to be here, really. <laughs> so, so, it wasn't hard for these kids to start preaching. Nobody pushed them out on the street and said, now you got to preach, you know, this is your spiritual duty. You could, wild horses could not keep these kids back from preaching. <laughs> so, 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds suddenly are preachers. Suddenly, they're going into the surrounding towns around Kunming, and, and into the city. Suddenly, they're, they're getting huge crowds in the marketplaces. Suddenly, they're talking to soldiers, coming to soldiers fearlessly. Suddenly, these little kids would get up in front of a crowd and develop adult voices and adult vocabulary. Suddenly, they're preaching with such authority, everybody listens. Nobody dares do anything, soldiers at all. Suddenly, they're prophesying against entire towns and villages to repent. Suddenly, huge crowds are getting saved. Suddenly, people are getting healed and miracles are happening. And when they're done, they sit down. They have been so taken over by the Holy Spirit that they have to ask their friends what it was they were talking about, what they said. Suddenly, they lapse back into their little child voice with childish vocabulary. So taken over by God. Someone said in the Welsh revival, a revival is, is a place where lots of people are just full of God. They're just full of God. And that's what happened to these little kids. It wasn't just a three-month visitation of visions. They just got full of God. Suddenly they're fearless. Suddenly they're empowered. Suddenly they're, they, they can see clearly. Suddenly they can see with an eternal perspective. Suddenly where they spend eternity matters. Suddenly spending life with their lover and best friend, Jesus, matters more to them than any blessing here on earth. Two-thirds of them were martyred in the Cultural Revolution. Two-thirds of them were killed by communists for their faith. The fiery ones. I asked much later, what happened to all these kids? And, well, most of them were killed. The really fiery ones who really wanted the most to be in heaven. <laughs> There's the remaining one-third still became pillars of the church. They still itinerated in the villages and mountains. They, be, you know, the communists threw out all the missionaries, so there was no one left to teach from the West. And so for a long time, these kids were the only ones available to teach in the mountains and areas where, where they could. And so many, many years, they, they were such demand. It was just, you know, village to village to village, itinerating in the mountains, just like my grandfather did before the communists made him leave. Uh, just teaching all day, every day in the villages. And these orphan kids literally were raised up in the Holy Spirit uh, to take over, to be leaders of the church. Um, but... <laughs> It wasn't the result of a strategy of anybody's. It wasn't like a mission board or my grandfather sat down and said, now we really need some discipleship here. We need to get a revival going here. Uh, here's how to get a revival going, you know. First we pick up a whole bunch of orphans, and then we have the Holy Spirit come down and take them up to heaven for three months. And then we have the Holy Spirit so empower them that nobody can resist on all sides. And then we have most of them martyred so everybody can see. And then we have these kids just get fearless. I mean fearless. They just tell the communists, look, you might as well execute me now. Because if you let me live, I'm just going to go start more churches. Okay? So you might as well execute me now. And the communists get lose such face over that. They just let them go. They just go to the tribal areas and they start more churches. my father's first graduating class in Bible school in Hong Kong every, after he had to leave China all got executed in China every last student got executed so when American churches and preachers start preaching the abundant life and the blessings of God and, and, and 
wealth, wealth and prosperity and all of that. It's coming, and for some people it comes now, for some people it comes later. But these kids got their priorities adjusted. <laughs> and <laughs> they're all so happy, filled with joy, because they've got God as their companion every day. these Chinese Christians taught me how much is possible for a human being to love God and how happy it's possible for a human being to get and they do so under circumstances that prove they know what they're talking about and so what we see in Mozambique it has been literally a continuation of that it, it's looked different in many ways but that's how it started we came here to see a continuation and within a few months we did Within a few months, our children were seeing visions. Our children were going out on the streets, preaching fearlessly to other street people. Within a few months, we had over 300 children. But then God started doing things that were very unusual. We had no idea. All we wanted was a, a building on the corner of a city block somewhere, somewhere we, where we could just have 50 kids or so like my grandfather. We just wanted a little orphanage and we wanted to see what God could do with that. We had no idea what he wanted to do with the whole country of Mozambique. <laughs> or Africa, for that matter. Or North Africa, where we are now in Sudan and Congo. I and... had no idea. Mozambique. <laughs> or Africa, for that matter. Or North Africa, where we are now. Okay. All right, boys and girls, that's the first flavor. Okay, then power from on high is what you're looking at, power from on high. And you're also looking at ascent one, power from on high and ascent one. But then there's the teachings, Acts 2.42, they were constantly devoted to that's the term in Greek that you get addicted to they were addicted to the Apostles teaching they were addicted to the details of the gospel that we should be obedient to which is what I call the goodies of Jesus you know what the word mitzvah means it's so funny the word mitzvah means a treat it means a good deed and it means a commandment. It's the same word. So, if you have somebody that really loves you and they say, hey, take the trash out, if you do that, it's a treat for you. It's a thing that you get to do because someone loves you so much. They have a place for you to be and in it there's a trash can. That's a mitzvah. A treat, a good deed, a command, an instruction. It's so amazing. It is so sweet to know the teachings of Christ. And as I has toured around in the church mess in America, the one thing that no one ever pointed out is that we are to get together in homes. And when we get together, the first thing is the sweet local elder has to say, okay, now, what's that little thing that God's asking you to do that you're chickening out on or that you're too lazy to do, like the rich young ruler or like King Saul? How are you avoiding your beautiful little calling from God the sweet one? That's the first question. That's the first fault that we're looking for, which is not an obvious sin. But then we also say, okay, what are the ordinary things that human beings do that you have done, let's just throw those things down. Because we can't pray if we've got troubled consciences. That's a fake. None of us can go into God's presence, receive communion, go into worship if our tr consciences are troubled. So we learn how to share our hearts with one another. That's the job. And people think I'm nuts to talk about this over and over again. But God has given me creative ways to sit down, 
just like Mr. Rogers and talk about all of the types of evil that human beings do in a fun, silly, positive kind of way. Not silly, but in a fun, sober, positive kind of way. Okay, let's review what people do. Have you been too stingy with your stuff? Are you bitter and you want to get revenge on somebody? Have you been lazy? Have you been inattentive to a voice of instruction? These are the things that we do. Then we take the communion, which is a mystical power meal, and we are unified because we have cleaned our hearts up and we're in a pure conscience together. And if a person's got a thing they need to deal with, they're asked to sit out. Oh, gosh, we love you, but you should sit out right now and you shouldn't be here for this communion. And as soon as we're done, we're going to come and help you take care of that thing that's on your heart. We are a completely unified, open-hearted, pure conscience family. We do the communion and then we begin hanging out with God and appreciating God and asking questions and those questions get answered in supernatural ways. Just like my experience in a home group meeting in Zion, Illinois, on the edge of Lake Michigan got an example of that and there were a handful of things missing in the Jesus teaching practices but like Roland says God is not a judgmental person he wants to gather up the hearts and show them how to go so peace be with you thanks for watching hold on Eric because there's a lot of stuff to do glory glory glory